Do you have thousands of important photos, videos, and documents scattered across your many devices or hidden away in shoeboxes? That is no way to preserve your family's history. Mylio Photos brings all your memories together in one place to be easily and safely organized and shared. To learn more about how Mylio Photos can help preserve your family legacy, visit mylio.com slash FTM. That's M-Y-L-I-O dot com slash FTM. Subscribe today and receive free gifts valued at $80. Your memories deserve Mylio Photos. Welcome to the Family Tree Magazine Podcast. I am Lisa Louise Cook. And in this episode, we're going to talk about using old newspapers to reconstruct the stories of your ancestors' lives with professional genealogist Stephen Went. Then in our Family History Home segment, you're going to learn about how an outline can really be the key to successfully writing your family history. Then we will wrap things up at the editor's desk with the editor of Family Tree Magazine, Andrew Cook, for a behind-the-scenes scoop on the next issue of the magazine. As always, there's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. First up is Tree Talk. Okay, well, let's kick off this episode with some Tree Talk, and uh, Rachel Christian is here. She's the social media editor at Family Tree Magazine. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, too. My gosh, there's been a lot going on in genealogy in the last month. Um, What's been on your radar lately? Yeah, so we have a brand new month ahead of us, and there's two things that I wanted to mention uh, in this episode. Uh, First off, April is a month where we traditionally celebrate DNA. National DNA Day is April 25th, and that is an annual holiday that celebrates different DNA discoveries. Uh, This year, it's extra special because we will be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the completion of the Human Genome Project, but also the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the double helix. So it's a particularly special DNA day this year. For genealogists, what this means is free webinars, free online events where you can ask your questions and learn more about DNA. It also means discounts on DNA test kits, usually the major testing companies offer pretty good discounts on kits. So if you're in the market, definitely look for those discounts right around April 25th. The next thing I wanted to mention is this April marks one year since the release of the 1950 U.S. Census. It's crazy to think that it's already been a year uh, since that was released. I remember last year it was all 1950 census all the time. And this year, we've got another census release to look forward to, and that is the 1931 Census of Canada. So that will be made available on June 1st of this year, and it's been confirmed that those digitized images will be made available on Ancestry and Family Search, as well as the Library and Archives Canada website. Lots to look forward to this spring going into summer. For more information about either the census release or DNA Day, Uh, As our listeners know, they can find more information in the show notes. Fantastic. Gosh, a year since the 1950 census release. I don't know where the time goes, but I'm looking forward to 1931 Canada census. So we've got some people to look up for, look up there. So wonderful. All right. We'll have links in the show notes for everybody. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great talking to you. Thanks, Lisa. You too. In his article, Case Study, Using Newspapers to Reconstruct an Ancestor's Story, author and professional genealogist Stephen Went says that old newspapers, quote, make the seemingly impossible possible, unquote. And he is here to tell us more about that. Hi, Stephen. Hi, good morning, Lisa. I was intrigued by your comments in your recent article about the newspapers making the impossible possible. I, I, I really agree, but I'd love to have you share with people what you really mean by that. Great. And I, I'm thrilled to be here to go over that um, with your audience here. Yes. So the value of the historical newspapers 
those that have been going online in recent years, especially during the COVID pandemic, um, made a huge difference in my experience. And I know in the, in the lives of other researchers, uh, basically in my case, I was able to take what was just a mere sketch of the ancestor that we're going to discuss today. And I was able to turn that into a lifelike portrayal. Newspapers, and I, I agree with you, bring such rich context. We'll see information, uh, let's say, that we would never see in, in a death record. But the article in a newspaper maybe has a firsthand account of what happened or talks about you know, the background of it. Or it could be any kind of event in our ancestors' lives. I, I really agree that it's amazing. They are such a unique collection compared to other more formal documents. I know in the article you talked about in, in your own research, how you used some of these unique stories and things that you found in newspapers to, to flesh out the story of your ancestors. Tell us about that. Yes. So with my great-grandfather, Hugo Went, we had known practically next to nothing about his life. Uh, living family members uh, basically knew that he had owned a dry goods store, and the setting of this um, article is in Big Springs, Nebraska, so southwest Nebraska in Dual County. And we also knew that there was a tragic train accident that took place. And uh, basically, we, we knew that he had uh, suffered an injury to his head, and the family lore behind that accident was that was the cause of the family's later separation of he and his wife and the four children got separated. So um, the historical newspapers really um, shed light on so many things. For example, um, I was able uh, with regards to the train accident, I was able to learn that uh, he had been on an eastbound Union Pacific train that left Big Springs, Nebraska. He was working as a cattleman. And basically, on the 27th of October, 1900, he ended up uh, experiencing near Gothenburg while asleep, uh, he was sleeping in the caboose of the first train, there was a mechanical failure that prevented the train's brakeman on that train that Hugo was on. The brakeman was trying to contact the engineer of a second rapidly approaching train. And then what happened was the engine of the second train collided with the caboose of the first train. Uh, train. That's where I mentioned that Hugo was sleeping inside. And the extent of his injuries provided unusual clarity. Um, for example, he suffered several burns from the engine of the second train's uh, steam, as well as three broken ribs and a bad cut on his head. So that was extraordinary. And basically, to take this a little bit further, uh, the accident took place almost 25 years before the family split up. So you can imagine um, what I was able to learn in the historical newspaper shed light based on uh, what was given um, in the vague family lore for decades. Yeah, that's amazing. That's the kind of detail and and um, kind of rich context that we just don't see in other kinds of records. Uh, you mentioned, I think, uh, newspapers.com. I, we, I know about, you know, there's Chronicling America, which is a huge free collection. Uh, were there other kinds of collections that you found on other websites that you used in your research? Yes, most definitely. While the emphasis of the article was on newspapers.com, I have found um, just a tremendous amount of information on Genealogy Bank as well. That's another uh, rich uh, repository for historical newspaper articles and obituaries that I would highly recommend as well. 
Oh, that's a great point. And we'll have a couple of these different ones listed on our show notes for this podcast episode. So those listening can maybe dig into old newspapers and have the kind of success that you did that you talked about in the article and and here today. Um, I'll bet you know, over time, you gain some real experience because each record collection, each search engine is a little different. Do you have some favorite tips or strategies that you use to be able to find what you're looking for? Yes. So when I started out as a newbie years ago, and this is before the huge um, dump on uh, newspapers.com that took place during the COVID pandemic, I had... um, learned about the train accident years before. And um, basically I had uh, employed what they call in genealogy is a wild card search. So you're basically using an asterisk uh, symbol before the certain characters that you know is in the word that's represented, but perhaps um, in an original article that gets put up online, perhaps the journalist writing the article Uh, misspelled someone's last name. And that's in fact what happened with the train accident. I was not able to readily pull it up online. And I um, had to uh, get creative with the wildcard search. Um, For example, instead of went in the article, the, my great grandfather's surname is listed as Welsp W E L S P. So you can imagine when um, I was first starting to do this years ago, that I was a bit frustrated, but um, with uh, perseverance and creativity, I was able to finally get that um, article online. And that was the beginning of many um, online historical newspaper discoveries. That's a great point. Sometimes feel like it's just that moment in time and you either find it or you don't. But it's so true. So much is being added online every day. I know that Chronicle in America is constantly getting new newspapers because different states around the country are getting grants and endowments and things to help them digitize their collections. And certainly, newspapers.com is adding to theirs as well. Um, so there's an awful lot to look forward to now and in the future. And I, I love that strategy with the asterisk. Uh, any other words of encouragement you have for our listeners as far as uh, searching for newspapers? Yes. In, in my experience doing this, it was an ongoing journey. For some, maybe it's just uh, a few searches and that's the extent to which a specific researcher may be able to find information. But in my case, I was able to do this on, in an ongoing fashion over time. And um, one other fascinating uh, story, if you don't mind my mentioning, um, sure. that's also represented in the article is that living family members did not know that my great grandfather, Hugo, had gone on to law school 10 years after the train accident and had... Um, also ran as a congressional hopeful in the Democrat Party. Uh, The Democrat Party represented the anti-prohibition position, at least um, a majority of the Democrat Party at that time. At any rate, living family members didn't know that he had gone to law school and that he had run in the Democrat primary in, in 1910. And so those were fascinating finds, among others, uh, too many to list during this uh, podcast interview and in the article for Family Tree Tree Magazine. But I just wanted to share those type of examples to give you inspiration for what you may be able to find for your own research. Wonderful. The, The article is called Using Newspapers to Reconstruct an Ancestor's Story. It's by Stephen Wendt. And Stephen... Thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today and inspiring us to search old newspapers. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Writing your family history might seem daunting, but a really good outline can help make the job much easier. So in today's Family History Home segment, I've invited Family Tree Magazine digital editor, and writer, Melina Papadopoulos, to tell us how to get started creating an outline that can really help us create an interesting story. Hi, Melina. Hi, Lisa. It's great to have you back. I know you're an accomplished writer, and I'm hoping that you're going to help us uh, 
you know, really have some success in writing our family history. So you say in your article that's going to be in the May June issue of the magazine that an outline is really key. So what is a writing outline? So a writing outline is basically what I like to think of as sort of a blueprint as to um, kind of help you get your ideas sorted out and as to who you're writing about in your family history, what you want to highlight about that person and details that you really want to stand out and um, make sure that readers understand about that person. And an outline isn't necessarily something that you have to, um, that you write, that you use to write your family history um, according to, you know, a a specific plan. It's more a chance for you to get a feeling for your thoughts and maybe learn things about your family history and your writing process that you didn't really think about until you got your thoughts down and your outline. Ah, So the outline is kind of a, a framework helps us kind of get organized. And so you don't get in halfway into it and then find out that you're kind of lost. I, I kind of like that idea. Yeah. And, and you mentioned in the article, there are several different types of outlines that we can choose from. So I'm curious what they are. And how do you decide kind of which one is the right one for your project? Yeah, so there are definitely many different outlines, types of outlines to choose from. Personally, you know, when I'm doing a writing project and trying to think of an outline, I, I typically try to um, just getting my ideas together first and don't necessarily focus on the type of outline I'm using. Um, but what I usually find is helpful is when I'm doing that outline is to sort of break my ideas down. And that's kind of where like the types of outlines come in. So for example, the, the first idea for an outline is the alphanumeric outline. And this outline is kind of probably similar to what a lot of us um, saw when we were writing a very structured essay or something in school, of that nature, right? Um, where you have, you kind of um, have numbered ideas, um, you know, you'll say, okay, this is my first idea. I, I'm going to be writing about um, grandmother's trip to the U.S. And then I also want to write about, you know, her fam- family upbringing and then maybe something specific she did, um, you know, in terms of occupation or something. And those are like the three main ideas I want to highlight in my article or, or my um, family history. Well, then after that, you're going to say, okay, you know, those are the three main ideas and you um, want to add on to those. And you might do that by um, having like little subtopics below those main ideas. So you might say, okay, my, you know, I'm starting with my grandmother's um, journey to the U.S. So um, below that, you might say that's where the the alphabet part comes in. You might say, A, you know, her um, challenges, you know, as she traveled, you know, B, her setting up her new home in a new country, um, and then maybe C, you know, um, finding a community that she um, felt where she belonged. And then you might go from there with the other points as well, just kind of like A, B, C, and um, until you kind of have like a fleshed out blueprint for what you kind of want to cover in your actual um, written work. So that's kind of one example, the alphanumeric outline. And the next um, type of outline that you might really enjoy if you're more verbal and have a lot of ideas you want to get out is the sentence outline. And the sentence outline is very much like the alphanumeric outline and that you kind of have a one, two, three starting point framework, and then you kind of look under those, um, you know, those main points with the letters A, B, C. And instead of just writing like a single word or phrase, you actually are writing full sentences. And as I said, the beauty of this type of framework or outline is that you get to um, write actual full sentences or even, you know, sometimes I find full paragraphs of things you want to cover in your family history. And even though you might not keep all the sentences you write, it definitely, it kind of helps you see your story you want to tell take shape and become more linear. I, I sometimes like to say, even though, you know, some family history is r- very rarely, oh, you know, A, B, this happened, this happened, this happened. But even though that's the case, it kind of helps you see like logic or pattern in your thought process. And that's what I really like about the sentence outline. And I definitely give you an example of a sentence outline in my article. So definitely check that out so you can get a feel for what that looks like. As I said, I don't always use the sentences that I write in my outline, and that's okay for anybody. You know, it's just, it's helpful to kind of get a feel not only for the structure of your family history, 
but also kind of for the style you hope to write in. If it's more of a narrative style where you kind of use very um, story, you know, a storyteller kind of um, language or or if you're looking to do something a little more expository, like this happened, this happened, the sentence outline kind of gives you the opportunity to do that and get a feel for what kind of voice or what kind of structure you want to take on. And then the final outline that I really um, find fun is the mind map. Now, there are many different tools for using a mind map and many different um, software programs and all sorts of things. Some are free, some have free trials, but what's important is that you find one that you like. And I actually give you a breakdown of mind maps and things of that nature in my article. But basically, just kind of give you a little feel for what a mind map does. It kind of allows a more visual person to... um, see for themselves where their ideas are going or where they're branching off to. Cause that's kind of what the mind map looks like. It kind of looks like it's branching off in many different places. So for a mind map, um, you might start with the main idea and then from there it branches off to um, kind of like it would in the other outlines. Oh, okay. Here, you know, here's point A, here's point B, here's point, here's point C. And then from there you might branch off and off those. And then that way you get like an idea of um, kind of where your ideas are going, um, how to trace them, how to um, line them up in your family history. And again, I have an example of a mind map in my article that might help you see what that looks like. But as usual with outlines, um, it's always good to remember that what works for you works for you. And um, an outline doesn't necessarily have to follow any specific structure or have any right number of points or sub points. What's important is that you're kind of able to... um, Use what works for you and get your ideas down and and guide yourself through a family history outline that can help ensure that you're writing the story that you want to tell. Yeah, exactly. I really like these three examples because it it suits each of, you know, different people's personalities. The alphanumeric, you kind of just hit the bullet points. The sentence outline, you get to be a little more verbal and tell a little more of the story. Uh And then the mind map, people like me who are very visual, you get to see it and really kind of make it turn into something that you can look at and follow. I love that. So to wrap it up, is there anything else that we need to do before we start creating our outline? Yeah. So what I find helpful to do before... um, starting my outline is first, of course, which might seem obvious, is just determining about who you're writing about and what you're writing about. So you might, you know, determine, okay, um, I'm just focusing on this one ancestor and I'm just focusing on their specific journey to wherever, you know, wherever they end up, or I'm focusing on my, you know, my whole father's side of the family. And these are the points I, and um, stories I want to cover. Um, I find that when you are able to kind of tell yourself, you know, this is what I want to work. This is what I want to write about. And this is who I want to write about. It's a lot easier to start your outline without feeling like you have to just go very broad and aren't sure like what ideas to zero in on. And of course, even, you know, the outline process does allow you to kind of, um, find specific things that you want to zero in on. But I find that even just into the process, kind of having an idea of who you want to write about makes it a little less overwhelming of a, um, a process overall, especially when you get to the writing process itself. Another thing that I find helpful is to kind of have an idea of how you want to organize your research that you find. So you know sometimes you get really excited, you um, you know look you look through so many different records or you find um, things, you know, you find heirlooms and things of that nature as you're going through your ancestors' things or um, history. And you kind of just want to like dump all that information into your outline at one go. And there's really nothing wrong with that. But sometimes I find that it's helpful to kind of find where that information belongs within specific points in your outline or specific places in your story that way, when you come to that point in your um, family history, it's a little easier to write about. So again, I kind of give an example of that in my article, um, in my own outlines. But you know, when I showed the um, journal that my grandmother made for me, made for me, and uh, where that fit into my um, family history, I find that that also kind of gives you the opportunity to um, kind of learn where those things fit into your into your own narrative into your own family history in a greater context when you look at your entire um, family history so um, organizing and integrating research is another big point 
And then another thing that I find helpful is to allow yourself to identify different threads in your story as you're um, kind of brain in the brainstorming process. So you might find that um, maybe different points in your ancestors history kind of connect and there might even be something very granular or very um, specific that you just let that you really grasp onto. Like, you know, I think I use the example of at one point, if you know, your grandmother's a really good cook and you have memories of cooking with her in the kitchen and that's something that she has always been known for. And you have different anecdotes about that. You might find a way to connect those threads or connect a specific um, dish she's, she made or specific technique she used as she cooked. And um, you might find that those narrative threads evolve organically and kind of come together to paint a really nice picture of who your ancestor was and who they are to you and your current um, as, as you currently are. So um those are some of the main strategies I like to um, use. And um, I find that they're helpful in um, keeping me on task. And like I said, you know, as I said before, and I'll, it's okay to like to, um, see an outline is temporary because that's kind of what it is. It's kind, it's just, it's a starting point and it's a chance for you to be creative and see where you want to start with your family history and kind of learn more about who you are, who your ancestors are and what kind of story you want to tell. And that's kind of what I like most about the outline process. I, it's not just a writing process. It's also a chance to learn. Exactly. And everybody can learn more about using outlines to create really interesting family history stories. Uh, you, I encourage you all to read Melina's article. It's called How to Create an Outline for Writing an Interesting Family History. Uh, we have a link to the online version, and then there's going to be an expanded version in the May-June issue of Family Tree Magazine. Thank you so much for helping us write our family history, Melina. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. Well, it's time to stop by the editor's desk. And today we're talking to the editor of Family Tree Magazine, Andrew Cook. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Lisa. Hey, what have you got in store for us in the upcoming May-June issue of Family Tree Magazine? Well, we're excited about this issue. I mean, I'm excited about every issue, but uh, this one I think is going to be really interesting to people. And it focuses on immigration and doing place-based research. The cover story is on how to research your ancestors in the colonial United States in the often overlooked period between the early colonies, think like the Mayflower or Jamestown, and the American Revolution. So that's uh, almost 170 years that of history there where people can learn about their ancestors, but it it isn't quite as, you know, catchy or as highlighted as either periods on either book in. We've also got an interview with our contributing editor, Sonny Morton, on the challenges of researching in one specific place and a worksheet that will help our readers keep track of their ancestral village once they have that information. Yeah, ancestral villages, that's something we all want to find, but that's not so easy. Do you have any strategies for us on that? Just maybe you could kind of whet our appetite for this? Well, the more specific that you can get about your ancestral village, the better, because you'll never know what kind of specialized records you might be able to find there. For my family, for instance, I know I come from a small village. My father's line comes from a small village in Romania. And if I had left it at that, I wouldn't have realized that because they were Germans living in this town, they created this really great resource called an Orts Familian book, which is a collection of family histories that goes back hundreds of years. And they list each family group by surname with cross references to other surnames. So you can track decades and decades of marriages and births of children. And so because I knew that Yes, they lived in Romania, but they were ethnic Germans. I knew to look for this particular kind of record and was really able to break down brick walls in my research. And, and you know, Rachel mentioned at the top of the show about the 1931 Canadian census that's coming out. You guys have a feature article coming out on French Canadian ancestors, am I right? We do, yep. And that sort of fits into the theme of researching in a specific time and place, especially when it's hard to come across records, French Canadian research that is done in Quebec or in other parts of Canada. Well, we really look forward to this May-June issue. Um, And you can find it not only on newsstands, there'll be a digital issue available also at familytreemagazine.com. Am I right? That's right. 
Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'll look forward to hopefully talking to you next month or so. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. This is the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. Uh, As always, I'm going to have the links on the show notes webpage for you to everything that we talked about today. You can find the show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast, and then look for this April 2023 episode. If you're listening in a podcast app, we would so appreciate it if you leave us a five-star review. Uh, It really helps other people find this show, and we really appreciate your support. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and you can visit me at my website, genealogygems.com. There you will find links to my podcast, the Genealogy Gems podcast, and also the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.